cooking. It's time for us to go fix some supper. Let's go. I'll race you to the house. Come on, let's go. I'm gonna take a shortcut and beat the little rascal. And there you are. Good boy. Gosh, you always beat me. How did you get here so quickly? You know all the shortcuts. All right, let's go in and have a treat. Come on, let's go. Good boy. I'm Alan Smith. You know, you can't go anywhere today online without finding some kind of a hack. You know, a way to get something done more efficiently or quicker. Well, some of those hacks work better than others, but when you find one, it can really pay off. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. You wake up one morning after a lovely evening dining with friends and you find yourself with one or two unfinished bottles of wine on your hands. Well, you hate to throw them away, but you won't be able to finish them before they turn to vinegar. So what do you do? I have an idea you might want to try. Coming up, tips for getting the most out of your hydrangeas. And later, a great way to preserve and use those extra leafy greens from your garden. So stay with us. Who doesn't love hydrangeas? I love them in the garden and I love them in the house. Just look at these. Aren't they gorgeous? Well, there's some tips to get them to last longer inside the house. And my friend Jay Schwanke, he's the best, and he'll let you in on his secrets. So here's some great tips for cutting hydrangeas. Always cut your hydrangeas early in the morning. As soon as the sun comes up, or just before, at that point in time, our hydrangeas are all fully hydrated. The next thing I like to do is take a bucket with me to the garden so that when I'm cutting them, I can drop them immediately into water. Then we get back into where we're gonna process them. So here, our hydrangea stems, I clip them off the bush using the snippers. But what I wanna do is, you'll notice that when I stick that in the vase, that bottom of the stem sits right on the bottom of the vase. So it's far better to cut my hydrangeas at an angle with a sharp knife. So that they're at a 45 degree angle, so that when they're sitting in the vase, the water can still travel up the stem. Now here's another great trick. We can add 
ice to our water. I know conventionally, we think about the fact that warm water would be better, but actually, ice water helps our hydrangeas stay more turgid and produces less bacteria. Now finally, one more trick is when you cut your stem, you can dip it into powdered alum, that pickling spice. It's perfect. And then place it into the ice cold water. What that does is it causes the vascular system to tighten up and it helps our hydrangeas remain turgid. Those are five great tricks for you to have perfect, beautiful hydrangeas every time. I love dahlias in my garden. They're so spectacular. And what a range of bloom and size of plant you can get in this glorious summer flowering bulb. They will grow from 15 inches to, well, almost six feet tall, depending on the varieties that you choose. And what's wonderful about them is that they'll bloom through the summer, but they really throw off a, a big show late in the season. Now, this is an old variety called the Bishop of Langdaff. Um, it's uh, named for a Welsh bishop. It was uh, developed in the 1930s, uh, but still very popular today because of its really deep red bloom and its deep sort of burgundy bronze foliage, which makes it a very handsome garden plant. Now, when you plant dahlias, you want to make sure that you give them a good deep soaking about once a week. You see, they grow from tubers. And when you fertilize dahlias to keep lots of beautiful blooms going, you don't want to fertilize with too much nitrogen because that will make the stems weak and it will cut down on your flower production. Rather, use a fertilizer that has more phosphorus in it. That'll make sure that you get lots of those big, beautiful blooms. Another way to keep them blooming is just to cut off any of the blooms that have already finished up. Just snip them off and this will encourage more flowering. There's nothing wrong with that. After the break, enjoy the health benefits of leafy greens year round with this do-it-yourself super green powder. If you're fortunate enough to have a bountiful harvest of greens, you may find yourself coming up short on ways to use them before it's too late. With a little planning and a lot of dehydrating, you can put those super greens to use year round. Just take a look at all of this kale. This variety is called winter boar and it is fantastic. It has a wonderful flavor to it and as you can see, it grows very, very well. One of the great things about kale, as we've all heard since it's held up as one of those great superfoods, is that it's highly nutritional. You can certainly eat it fresh like this, or you can make your own super green powder. And why not? It's very nutritious, and it's a way for maybe some of those finicky eaters to get the nutrition they might need from a beautiful plant like this. And hey, you don't have to grow the winter boar kale like I have here. You can just pick it up from your local market and give making the powder a try. It's really easy and inexpensive. The first thing you'll want to do is, of course, harvest or buy your preferred greens. Then wash, dry, and pull the leaves off the stems. And then arrange them on a cookie sheet. Make sure that it's a nonstick surface. I like to use a little olive oil. Next, place the cookie sheet in the oven at the lowest temperature for about three hours or until the greens are super crumbly and dry. Once they're ready and have cooled, simply crush the leaves to a powder with your hands or a rolling pin and save it in an airtight container. For this project, I use kale because I have such an abundance of it in the garden that you can use any nutrient-rich green. I found that spinach and Swiss chard work well too. You can even make a variety and mix them all within the same jar. To make it a finer powder, simply place it in a blender, food processor, or even a coffee grinder. You see, the finer the powder, the smoother it mixes. 
Use a scoop of it to add extra nutrients to smoothies, sauces, or even scrambled eggs, which I love. Hey, it's green eggs and ham. Takes you back to Dr. Seuss. Give it a try. You know, we always have to deal with stains and keeping our clothes and things that we use in the house clean. But if you're not into using a chlorine bleach and you're looking for a green alternative, I've got some things you might want to consider. First of all, one of the easiest things to do is just use baking soda. You can take a cup of baking soda and just add it to the laundry detergent that you are already using in your washer and what you'll find is that your whites come out brighter and cleaner. That's one idea. Okay, the second is to think about using peroxide. You can actually take a cup of peroxide and add it to your wash, particularly when you're trying to get those whites clean. Okay, you start your laundry, it fills up, and before it engages, you pour the peroxide in, one cup, and you let it sit there for one hour, then you close the lid, engage the washer, and let it run through its cycle. Also, you'll find that if you're trying to get rid of a really tough stain like blood in a fabric, peroxide is really good. Just let it soak on that stain for a while before you throw it into the washer. The last is probably the easiest of all. That's using ultraviolet light. From where? The sun, of course. So you can hang these clothes out on an old-fashioned clothesline and brighten and freshen all of those sheets or clothes that you have hanging out there. So you're not using your dryer, so you're not using energy, which is another green approach. Next, you may have heard of planting pumpkins, but how about planting in pumpkins? We'll show you how when we return. You know, it's just amazing to me how a few planters can change the entire mood of a space. And hey, if you're like me and like to change things around, well, having planters can be your best friend. You can easily alter the plants, change the location, vary their heights, and get a completely different look. Change the mood of any space by adding a few planters. Need some help narrowing down your choices? Check out my website, pallensmith.com. If you enjoy the autumn tradition of decorating with pumpkins, you'll enjoy this creative way to get maximum use out of Harvest Time's favorite gourd, the pumpkin. Why not use them as vessels for veggies, herbs, and flowers? Today we're making a fun recyclable container for some bright colored flowers, perfect for composting after the pumpkins lost its luster. Like any project involving pumpkins, this one starts with carving a nice sized hole in the top and cleaning out the guts. Now you'll want to make the opening wide enough so you have plenty of room to get your plants in. Use whatever kind of pumpkin suits your fancy, and believe me, there's a myriad of them to choose from. But I've found that the fatter, flat bottom ones work best for stability. Now once you've finished cleaning out the pumpkin, now the fun begins. On the face, you can paint something or you can carve something. Use your imagination. Then it's time to actually apply some soil. What you want to do is fill it about halfway. You want to leave plenty of room for your plants. That's pretty good. You can see we've got it in there. And then it's just a matter of sliding a plant into the pumpkin, settling it in nicely like this. Now you'll want to make sure you water this just as you would an ordinary container. But this is a very simple version. You can use your imagination and come up with something with, say, ornamental grasses. Now once your lovely little planter starts to look a little worse for wear, you can plant it directly in the ground. As the pumpkin begins to break down, it will provide your young plants with extra nutrients that they'll be sure to enjoy. I think it's important to note, if you choose a paint for your pumpkin as part of your decor, you shouldn't plant it into the ground, lest you leach harmful chemicals into your soil. 
Once you get started, you'll have so much fun, you'll get carried away like I did. I did this grouping of three. The main thing is just get creative, have some fun, and in the process, you'll be improving your soil and feeding your plants. Why pay high prices for wood stain when you can use kitchen leftovers? Let's see how after the break. Looking to do some wood staining on a budget? We've got an inexpensive and easy way of using ingredients you probably already have lying around the kitchen. Check it out. How about a stain you can create with ingredients from your own kitchen? And hey, it really, really works. Take a look at the color difference in these two picture frames. This is made of pine, it's been untreated, and this one has been stained with a stain that you can make, well, right out of your own kitchen with some really basic ingredients. Let me show you how to do it, because it's all natural, and well, the results, as you can see, are really pretty nice. What you want to start with is a quart jar. This will contain the stain. And it's as simple as taking a half a cup of coffee grounds. And these are grounds that you've already used. You don't want it to smell like coffee. And then you're going to take a steel wool pad. And I'm gonna cut this into uh, pieces, just small pieces like this. There's one, two. Oh, and if you buy steel wool, if it has soap in it like this, you wanna make sure you rinse all the soap out first. Next, what you're going to do is take the pieces of steel wool and just drop them into the jar like this. You see, what you're doing is you're creating a chemical reaction that comes up with a color, which I think has a nice natural look to it. Now this is all activated by vinegar. I'm just using white vinegar. You could use balsamic, but it means your stain is gonna be slightly greener in color. So what you do is you just take this white vinegar and you fill up the quart jar all the way to the top with those ingredients like this and seal it off and you're gonna wait one day. Now, if you wait two days, your stain is gonna be slightly darker. So this has been soaking for one day. You can see my steel wool is beginning to dissolve. Then you wanna take it and apply it with a steel wool like this across the plane of wood, making sure that it's fully saturated. This technique comes in really handy if you have to replace, say, a fence panel on your privacy fence or maybe boards on your deck where they've weathered this nice silvery gray like this table has. You put a new board on there and you want it to match the others. Rather than having to replace all the boards, you can do it and you can get this color so it looks like that it just fits right in and you can't tell that it's been replaced. Now, once you coat this, you're gonna let this dry. And once it's dry, you'll probably wanna apply another coat on it. It takes about 30 minutes for the chemical reaction to occur and then this is the sort of look you get. So have a little fun with this. It's easy to make and very effective and all natural. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. Well, we've covered a lot of projects in today's show. We've only scratched the surface in terms of ways one can hack your way through life, making things a little easier. So the next time you're faced with a challenging task, try to think of it in a completely different way. You never know, you may come up with your own shortcuts. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. All right, let's get these eggs going.